As a child, I would think of my parents and I would feel very alone. There was a deep longing to be part of my family. I would wonder why I had to be born. My father was already married when he began seeing my mother. They had a relationship which culminated in my birth. My father chose not to have any contact with me. My mother was relatively young and she gave me to my great auntie. But my mother also had other children that she kept. And so I grew up being told I was unacceptable. I would ask questions. I would wonder why I never saw them. No calls, no birthday cards. Why did my parents not want me? My great aunt that raised me, she would reinforce that sense of rejection by telling me things like children like you, whose parents aren't married, they call them bastards. It made me feel ashamed I mean, if your own parents don't seem to love you, <laughs> why would you feel lovable by anybody else? My father, I met him literally only one time in my life. It wasn't like you see in the movies where people finally find their parents and rush into their long lost mother or father's arms. It wasn't like that for me. He was a stranger to me. I so much wanted a relationship with my dad, but I just knew better than to expect anything. I just couldn't. I remember as a little girl singing, Jesus loves me, this I know. I would wonder if he loved everybody why he let me be born into that situation. Why someone who supposedly loved me enough to die for me didn't even love me enough to give me a family. There was a church that met in my neighborhood. I was able to walk to it. I didn't even realize I was supposed to read the Bible. I just thought I was supposed to show up to church and hear a message and go home. I learned that you were a sinner and you needed forgiveness. The church, for me, it was rules without love. I just said, forget it. I was angry with God. I didn't believe God really loved me. And I just walked away. I just hoped to find happiness. I actually wound up joining the military and got married young. It only lasted a couple years. I was all in and he was not. Then I met my second husband. He was emotionally abusive. He mocked the fact that I wasn't wanted by my parents. That was very heartbreaking and shameful to me. You're depending on them to love you. I wanted to know that I was wanted, and it never happened. It was a Tuesday, September the 11th, 2001. I remember it being a beautiful day. I was working for the federal government. I remember passing by a TV monitor, and people were standing around it, staring at it, and so I stopped and looked at it. There was all this chaos in New York. One of the Twin Towers being on fire. There's the announcements over the PA system. Something was happening in Washington, D.C. The Pentagon had been hit. But you could see the smoke from the Pentagon. Everybody's freaking out. The people don't know what's happening. They don't know why it's happening. The fear in the air, I have never felt fear like that in my life. I drove home parked my car, ran into the house, and the first thing I did was turn on the TV. 
by that time, there was coverage of people jumping out of the Twin Towers. And I was sitting there, stunned. At that moment, I just, I wanted God to exist so much. God, please be there, I hope you're there. I was very afraid because if there's not a God, there's no hope. Fear became the overriding emotion. The next thing I knew was, you've got to get back to church. You've got to get back to church. That Sunday, I walked through that door, and from that day forward, it was full steam ahead with me and God. That church, they presented God to me in a way that I had never experienced Him before. I finally was told, read your Bible, read it every day, that's where you meet Jesus. Who knew? I didn't know. I remember reading in Jeremiah where God told Israel, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And just that phrase melted me. He became more of a person, a person with my emotions and my feelings, someone who understands me. I wanted God, I wanted Him totally, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, I was ready. I said, I want you to love me with an everlasting love. a father and not just a father, but the perfect father. It was freedom for me, freedom from rejection, freedom from lack of self-esteem, freedom from fear of being lonely. He helped me to understand, I've always been your father. You had to go through what you had to go through to get to the place where you are now, but I was always your father. And so I forgive my earthly father and I receive the love of my Heavenly Father. settled in my soul, I am content and at peace. I was welcomed into the arms of Jesus. I was welcomed into the arms of my Father. He is my home. I am lovable. Mm, powerful, isn't it? Powerful testimony. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about today is about the love of God. And again, I hope this will be a blessing to you and I hope God can speak to our hearts and uh, re really make known how He feels about us. Now, you know, love can be a, a joyful subject or it can be a painful subject. It depends on your experience with it, right? If your heart's been broken... You don't really like to talk about love, you know. But if you're in that newlywed stage or just dating somebody, it's all lovey-dovey, ushy-gushy stuff like that, right? It makes you sick sometimes. <laughs> but uh, it all depends. It all depends on your experience with it. So it's a touchy subject. When I, when I was um, going to church, when I went to Bible school and things like that, got to go in our first churches, um, the love of God just wasn't, it wasn't really conducive to the sermon type that they you know, would preach there. It was a lot more hellfire and brimstone and uh, you're all a bunch of sinners, right? 
But on the other end, I knew some people that um, were kind of preaching that mushy, marshmallowy love of God, just ooey gooey dripping off of them. Almost to the point where it wasn't even, you know, it wasn't, it was almost fake. It was almost like a facade. It was just like, you know, look at me, I'm spiritual. I just love Jesus and, and uh, just love, you know, and it's like, you're not really real, you know. Now, both extremes are, are wrong. We want to find what the Bible says, the love of God. Now, if you did a web search, which I did, you go on the web and you put in there, um, definition of love and hit enter. This is what's going to come up. Basically five definitions besides the tennis one, okay, which we're not going to include that one. But the five definitions used for love, the first three or four as a, as a noun. It is an intense feeling of deep affection, a great interest and pleasure in something, a person or thing that one loves. And then love as a verb is feel a deep romantic or sexual attraction to or like very much find pleasure in. So that's the Western definition of love. Now, I don't know if you can tell right off the bat, but it, it's, it doesn't really jive with the Bible definition of love. Because whenever God says, love your enemies, when Jesus says that, you can't really fit one of those definitions in that. You just don't feel ooey-gooey, lovey-dovey, you know, to your enemy. So the Bible's definition of love is a little bit different. Now, the best way to understand the Bible's definition of love is to see what the Bible says. So in 1 John, we want to look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 8. Uh, the Apostle John wrote this, Beloved, let, let us love one another, for, God is of, for love is of God, and everyone who love is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For, and this is the key phrase, for God is love. For God is love. Now, what happens is a lot of people want to take that and they just run with that. God is love, God is love, God is love. Now, in, in theology, they have this terminology called the perfections of God. Some call them the attributes of God. It's what who God is. And some people want to make that it's all God's love, but no, God has other attributes, other perfections, because they are perfect in him. God has truth. God has justice. God is righteous. God is holy. God is unchanging. He is all-powerful. All these things that makes up who God is. So God is not just love. Now, some people want to, you know, they try to make it a pie. And I, it's like I said, you know, pizza is a big, we had pizza last night. So, you know, pizza is a big deal in my house, okay? My wife's Italian, even though she doesn't eat pizza, but, you know, we pizza, 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 you know. We lived up in Connecticut, man, it's pizza, pizza, pizza. We just love, grew up on pizza. So, but, you know, people think about pizza, and, you know, in my family, when we, I used to have to tell the kids, because we can only buy however many and say, hey, everybody gets two slices, Two slices, that's all you get, two slices. Well, of course, you know, the bigger boys, whatever, they run over there, and they would get the two biggest slices, see. And then, you know, whatever, that's what they try to do. So God's not sliced like that. You know, he's not like where love is a bigger slice, you know, and righteousness is a little bit smaller. Or how we were in some churches, you know, judgment of God was this big old huge slice. God's love was just this little bitty sliver. That's not how God is. Now, some people say, oh, well, God is evenly sliced. So his slice of love is as big as the slice of justice, and there's the slice of righteousness and the slice of holiness. But that doesn't work either, because God's not sliced up. He's not a piece of this and a piece of that. God is love, all of him. But God is just all of him. And God is righteous all. So it's, it's, it's all God. It's all God. It's not sliced up. So when we're talking about the love of God, we have to understand really who God is. 
Uh, one person defined it as love in God is seeking the highest good and glory of his perfections. That's those attributes. But here's the key, without selfishness. See, without selfishness. God's not doing it all, look at me, pat me on the back. It's not who he is. He doesn't do what he does just to, for selfish reasons. That means then when, he, when I look at love, the love of God to me, that means that God loves me and he seeks the highest good and for me to partake of his glory without selfishness. So when I think of that, I have to, you know, remember that when I look at how God loves me. So we're going to get into four things, four simple things about God's love. The first is God's love is more than words. God's love is more than, than words. If, if you're ever with somebody, you know, there's always... That who says I love you first? You remember that? You know? And, uh, I, you know, well, back whenever me and my wife were first dating, they, the phones were connected to the thing that you dialed. I don't know if you knew that, but the handset was, had a cord to it. And then that device also had a big, long cable you know, and it depends on if your mom and dad are nice and had the, how long the cable was. And you would, you would pick up the phone and you'd walk around the house and go where you could go. That's what you did. Yeah. They yeah, have mobile phone. That was the first mobile phone, right? And you pick up the phone and you... And so at my, my house, the phone was right in the middle of the house, right there where all the traffic of the house was. And they had a little desk there. And so you'd slink down on the desk where the phone was, you know, and I'd call Sherry and I, so no one could hear how silly I sounded. And I love you. No, I love you. I said it first. No, I said it first. I love you more. No, I love you more, you know. But you know what? The love of God is more than words. Now, God does tell us, I love you. It's written right here. But it's more than just ink on paper. And I know some of the things that I've been through, that's, that's really what it was to me. It was just ink on paper. It was just words on a page. It really didn't have much meaning to me. I, my, I lost my love for God. I got mad at God. But I had to be, I had to, God had to show me that it's, it's more than just words. You know, talk is cheap. And why talk is cheap is because unless there's action put to that talk, it really is no use. Right? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to rib my kids here. Oh, I'll take out the trash. Two days later, it's still there. You can tell me that. Right? Oh, I'll pick up my room. Yeah. Yeah, when you finally pack up and leave, right? <laughs> You'll pick up your room. Talks cheap. It says in First John chapter four, verse nine. It says, "In this, the love of God was manifested toward us." God just didn't tell you He loved you; He showed you that God had has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. So God just didn't say it, God proved it, and God showed it. God put action, action to his words. My dad um, never would tell me he loved me. He would never tell me he loved me. Uh, my, my dad was a rough kind of a guy. Um, and so I'd, I'd always um, tell dad, hey, I love you. You know, when I got saved as a, you know, as a living year old, Later on, I'd tell my mom and dad, I'd always give my mom a kiss at night, even when I was 19, 20 years old, when I you know, was living at the house before I left to go somewhere, or even when I came by and see him, I'd give my mom a kiss, and I'd walk over there, and I'd kiss that old rough, gruff, pokey cheek of my dad. Love you, dad. All right, now. That's how he'd talk. On the phone, I'd say, I love you, dad. Okay, you have a good one. He just would not say those words. 
But you know what? I know he loved me. I do know now he loved me by the things that he did. Every morning when I got up for school, my dad would get up and cook me breakfast every morning while I was in high school, especially my senior year. Eggs, bacon, he made me a full breakfast every morning. You know, so, but so with God, you know, it's more than words. It is, it's action. God loves you. Romans 8, 32 says, He, God, that spared not his own son, but he delivered him for us. So God's love is more than words. God's love is more than affection. God's love is more than affection. You know, we talked about in Saul that definition, you know, of what Westerners think of love. God's love is more than that. It's more than um, doing what makes you happy, right? When, when, my, um, when my kids, especially my two oldest ones, now my other son, he, he, got, he was like in the middle, but he wasn't fully, but now he's on the last end of it, so he's like, it's cream puff with him. But then... When they were little, man, I was tough. Man, I, I just did not give any grace. I was hard on them. And later on, I, I uh, apologized to them and said, man, I'm sorry for being so mean, so being so hard on you guys. And uh, some of the kids are nudging their parents like that. No, now hold on. But, you know, they told me, they said, no, you know, Dad, it's okay. It's okay because that made us what we are, you see. Buy their own cars, go to their own school, pay for their own colleges, doing their own thing, man, taking care of themselves. My, my wife is a good mom. She is good. I'm not saying, <clears throat> but we, you know, one, of, one it's illustration of this, my son, um, had to walk to going to college in Tyler, worked about an hour and a half away, right? Something like that. He had to walk to work. Ride didn't show, whatever. He had to walk. My wife's like, well, we got to go down there and pick him up. We get there and we do this and that. And we got him. I said, honey, no, let him walk. She thought I was just the evilest father there ever was. I said, no, you know, he, let him walk. I know it's tough. You got to let him walk. It'll make him a man. It'll make him a man. You know, so parental love, just in itself, parental love is more than affection, it's correction, right? It's to, it's to help you. God does not take pleasure in seeing things happen to us, He doesn't take pleasure in correcting us, He doesn't take pleasure in the things that we go through. It grieves His heart, but He knows it's good. For us, and I'll show you here. In Hebrews chapter 12, it says this For you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, for, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him, for whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son or child whom he receives. So God, you know, he, he corrects us when we need it. You know, but some things that we go through is not God's punishment. Some things is just this sinful life, and that's completion. And it's not on, on we don't have a slide for it, but in James chapter 1, he says this, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have a perfect work that you may be complete and entire, lacking nothing. You know, God lets those tragedies and those things in life and this sinful life go, th you know, happen to us when we go through those things because he's working in us to make us complete. And that's hard for even a heavenly, you know, parent. He doesn't take, jo take joy in that. It, it grieves him to see us suffer. But he knows that Love is more than affection. It's doing, it's for our good. And it's hard to say that in the midst of school shootings and terrorist attacks and death and disease and terrible things. But like, like Angela said on the video, that's 
you know, if you don't have hope, if you don't have a hope in God, man, what, what do you have? So, love's more than words. God's love is more than affection. And then also God's love is, comes from God first. <clears throat> you know, don't ever think that you found God. I know we use that term as Christians. Well, I found the Lord. No, my friend, you, you, didn't, you didn't really find him. He was seeking you and he was after you and he was doing this here and bringing up this here and trying to get your attention. He was after you all the time. You never found God. He was never lost or missing. In John chapter 4, verse 19, it says, we love him because he first loved us. In Luke chapter 19, verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So, you know, God sought us out. God, before, the, the, the Bible says that before, <laughs> you, know, you know, they say before you were a twinkle in your daddy's eye, right? My brother said, in case you were a sty in my, our dad's eye, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was a sty. Yes, that little sore you get in your eye. If you don't know what that means, it was a joke, by the way. It's a joke. <laughs> but, um, you know, before you ever were ever thought of, right? Before there was ever creation, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit knew what they were going to do. They were going to die for you. The son was to give his life for you. And, and, I, and sometimes we don't realize this, you know, it really sink in. But, you know, if you had been the, if you had been there in the garden, it was you and you were the only one. And there was nobody after you. Christ would have died for you. You got to understand that. I mean, God doesn't weigh and say, OK, well, we got enough souls. I guess Jesus is worth. No, it's not like that. I mean, the Father had you in his mind by name and said, I'm dying for Angela. You see, God loved you first. The verse that she, that, that she quoted, she meant to her is Jeremiah 31.3. The Lord has appeared of old to me saying, this is what the prophet Jeremiah said, yes, I have loved you. Talking about the nation of Israel, but it's still applied to us. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness have I drawn you. You know, the passage where it says that Jesus uh, came to seek and to save. Man, that word seek means seek to an end. In my house, if I say, hey, where's the TV remote? This is what it is. I don't know. Did you look for it? Yeah? No, you didn't look for it. Did you look under the couch? Oh, no, I didn't think about that. Did you look in the cushions? N no. Did you look in the refrigerator? Because my son put it in the refrigerator one time. Cody put it in the refrigerator. Um, no, I didn't, didn't think about that. That's not how Jesus sought you, you see. Jesus sought you with intent to teach you. Now, it's your free will. It's up to you whether or not you choose him as the forgiver of your sins and the leader of your life. But he's still going to seek you. God loves you first. And then the last one is God's love compels us to act. God's love compels us to act. You know, love is a far greater motivator than fear. I mean, fear is good. Trust me. It's the fear of God that kept me from doing some pretty stupid things in my life. I mean, you know, it was, it was just that thought of, man, if God lets this come back on me, oh, man, it's going to be bad. I think I'll just skip this. And that's good. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But that shouldn't really be our full motiv motiv motivator. It should be the love that we have for God. 
In 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15, it says this, For the love of Christ compels us. Because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all are dead. And he died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So my love... He says there, for the love of Christ compels us. So, you know, it, it's interesting how that, that word, that phrase can go because it can mean that my love, the love I have for Christ compels me, or it can mean the love that Christ has for me compels me. And actually it is thought by smart people, I guess, that study the scriptures that this, this is one of the few passages and wordings that means the same. It means both. That God's love for me and knowing that love compels me to love him. And that motivates me. Now that love is unconditional. Romans 5 says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While, while we were still in our sin, it's... You know, Christ didn't say, okay, I'm just going to die for the ones who believe. I'm just going to die for the righteous. It's not like that at all. None are righteous. It's unconditional. If you can't earn it, right, if there's, if there's nothing you can do to get it, then there's really nothing you can do to diminish it, which is also in Romans chapter 8. Paul said this, for I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. God's love compels us to act. It should anyway. You know, I, I learned love in a marriage from my wife, believe it or not. I learned love from her. Because she has that, she just has some of the things that I'm, you know, my knucklehead ways, she just, i just seen love in her. And so I, I've learned that. I've learned love from her. And it's, I think it's helped me to, to love her more, not just her, but others too. I'm a nice guy now. I'm actually, am I nice, Clay? Yeah, Clay says I'm, I'm nice now, you know. But you know, see that again, that, that love that was shown to me, it, 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 it showed who, what I was. It showed where I lacked. And that's what God's love should do. It should show you when, when you see, wow, God loves me. But let me tell you this. But I, I struggled with the love of God because I read this passage. It's in Luke chapter number 7 in verse 36. And there's a lot of verses. We're just going to read part of it and then kind of talk about what goes on. He says here uh, in Luke chapter 7, it says... Um, Then one of the Pharisees asked him, asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner. Now you got to understand, in the Bible, that means is a really, 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 really bad person. Okay? And when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at at his feet, at Jesus' feet, behind him, weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe, wipe them with the hairs of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. And when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself. He just thought in his own heart, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who, had, who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner." See, the Jews had the, you know, they, they knew in the law said that if someone unclean touches you, that makes you unclean. So they, they wouldn't have anything to do with sinners. And the story goes on that Jesus knew his heart and turned to him and said, hey, Simon, I got a question to ask you. He said, oh, teacher, say on. And he says, you know, there's this debtor, or, or this was a, a, a debt collector, more or less. And he had two people that owed him. One owed him 50 Pence, which is equivalent to 50 days worth of wages, about a month and a half. And he said, this other man over here owed him 500 pence. And since neither one could pay him, he forgave both. 
Simon, which one do you think would love him more? And Simon said, well, Lord, I guess the one he forgave more. And he said, you've answered rightly. He said, you know, this, this woman came in and you haven't really done anything. You didn't wash my feet, which was a custom that the Jews did because your feet got dirty as you walked around in your sandals, you know, in this dusty place. He said, you know, you didn't, you didn't wash my feet when, you, when I came in. You didn't anoint me with oil. But here, this, this lady here has been doing all this for me. And he says here in Luke chapter 7, at the, verse 47, he says, Therefore I say unto you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Now I thought that when I remember reading that as a teenager, because here I was a teen that got saved at 11, and I didn't drink I didn't smoke in my entire life. I was pure. I, I believe it or not, I was a I was a cusser at 11 year old. I learned it from my father. So I was a, just. But when I got saved, I quit. Just quit. So here I was. I, I wasn't a gangster. I wasn't a. I wasn't a bank robber. I wasn't a drug dealer. I wasn't. And I thought to myself, man, how can I love the Lord? How 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 can I love Him if I haven't done all these evil things? But what I didn't realize is that the Bible says God looks on, I mean, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart, you see. And the passage is, if we could put it, it's Mark chapter 7, that's second to last. He says, and Jesus said, for, for from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, Murders. You ever hated somebody? Thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. And then you know, when I realized that, yeah, you know, I might not have done all these external things, but in my heart I was desperately wicked. And when I saw that, especially whenever I turned my back on God and I walked away from the Lord after 20-something years because I got mad at what God allowed to happen in my life, I, I saw really how wicked I was. And when I went to the Lord, it, it gave me a love for Him I've never had because I saw how sinful I really was. Because to whom much is forgiven loves much. And so the key, my friend, is not that you had this wicked past. If you did, that's fine. But even if you haven't, even some of you teenagers who got saved young, you know what it is? It's because when you see, man, I'm a rotten, no good sinner. I'm just as wicked as this, the, the most wicked person you could think of. I am no better than they. God saved my soul. And made me whole. And through my sins as far as the east. And, and that, knowing that, you see, will make your love grow for him. But you got to see yourself in the light that God sees you. For who you really are. Now there's a song that's kind of sweeping America. It's called The Reckless Love of God. It's a good song. Some people will kind of don't like the word reckless. But the author, if you can get online, you can, you can see how he defines it, what he says. It's kind of like reckless, the good part, not the bad part. And the reckless, that is, meaning that God does, Jesus did not care about what people thought, what people said, how it would, you know, how it would affect his reputation. He did, he just, he acted. He, uh, his story is he left the 90 and 9 and went after the 1. See, some would say, that's, that's reckless. No, that's not reckless. If that is, then that's the love of God. Because he goes after that which is lost. You see. So I want to gonna play this song. And you listen to these words. And I hope, you know, pray and however God deals with you. Um, and then we'll close afterwards.
before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. And you have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Cry every time. Powerful. God loves you. God loves you. And he's seeking you. Maybe you're not a Christian. He's Man, he's hard after you. He wants you to come to him. Maybe today's the day for you. I hope so. Christian, you're away from God. Doing things you shouldn't be doing. Lost your love. And God pursues you. Come back to him. Come back to him. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, that your, your love is unending. It never diminishes. It can't be earned. Uh, Lord, you love us despite our sinfulness. Father, help us, Lord, to really see how much um, you, you have done for us and forgiven us and that you gave your son for us, that he died and rose again, that we might have eternal life and might have a place where you will wipe away all tears and all the pain and the sorrow of this world will be gone. Father, pray to help us, Lord, to love, love you, to fall in love with you, 
We serve you with all our hearts. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I thank you so much. Um, but I do have to do announcements. I wrote it down this time. I'm doing better. So we have the joy basket. Yes. That is our giving basket here at uh, New Life. It's how we give. Um, back there in the back, our three baskets. Well, you can also give through PushPay online or NLCP.com. We can do that. We also have a registration basket. I know. And the registration basket is for your cards. So in case you have any prayer requests or even praises, you write these on your cards with your name. It goes in the basket. Again, only our pastor, Doug, looks at that, the backup pastor. I do not look at those cards. Only the pastor does. Unless you want someone else to know about it, and then he'll let groups of people, whatever, to know to pray for something or whatever. So please fill that out. He, we love, he loves, I know, to know those things that are going in your life. He can pray for you. The last one is the bagel basket. I love it too. It's, it's how we pay for things around here. Thank God our church, our, our members know this, our church is debt free and that's how we're going to be. We we believe that and it, whatever is built here or done here, it's going to be paid with cash and that's what we've been doing here for the last few years and God's been very gracious by doing that. So stand up, hug however many people you want to hug and you are dismissed.